Hello everyone, it's Tekken and Coffee episode two. In case you missed the first one, what I do here is I sit down with my morning coffee and I go to the Tekken Reddit and look for interesting questions and topics that we can think about together. I'm not gonna have hot coffee today because it's very hot outside. The monsoon has started. It's gonna rain for about a month. We're gonna have like thunderstorms every day. I don't know if you can hear it, but the rain is crashing down right now, but I've got some nice uh, cold canned coffee, which is refreshing on a hot day. And we're just going to start scrolling here and see where we end up. I've already uh, scrolled down a little bit because there was a lot of like fan art and memes on top. But now we're getting to some really interesting questions. This first one I think is important. Is it worth it to get uh, an arcade stick for PS4? It's an important question because good sticks, and if you're going to get a stick, you should get a good one. They're very expensive, so it's a big investment to make as a player. Don't feel you have to get a stick in order to be good at the game. The reason you see so many top level competitors use a stick is because back in the day, fighting games were mainly played in arcades and that's where a lot of players learned them. And they also have this sentimental connection to the stick. You know, it, there's a big connection between fight sticks and fighting game culture. So now that we play them mainly in the home, the idea is to like try and emulate that experience with these sticks that you can connect to your console or your computer. But these days, some of the top level competitors play on pad. I think Anakin plays on pad. I'm pretty sure Margin plays on pad. So there you go, like proof that you can get to the top, top level uh, using a control pad. It's a, a fine way to play the game. Uh, I only have experience with the PS4 pad, but I think it's amazing. I can play on both, but I honestly prefer the pad more and more because it's just so convenient when you move around. You go to uh, tournaments and you see people with their big backpacks and they're lugging these huge sticks with them, but a control pad you can just put in your pocket and walk, you know? So if you're going to get a stick, get it because it's like fun, you know, because fighting games, this is your hobby. You want to express that. It's fun to think about which one to get, the different designs and layouts. I mean, some people collect them. They're cool items to have. So buying your first stick can be a very fun experience, but don't feel that you have to get one. And if you already own PS4, then that obviously comes with a control pad. So you already own a, an ideal controller for playing the game well. Negan tips. I really like Negan, but I uh, can't really pull off uh, combos other than the L1s and the square triangle combos, any other combos that would be useful. I don't know what you mean by L1s and square triangle combos, but a very easy combo that doesn't require like any execution almost with Negan, you don't even have to stance transition into intimidation, is you can launch up forward four, forward three, up forward four, one jab back, one two, and then that's your spin. And for the ender, you can run up and do forward three, two as normal. And that'll give you, I think, about 60 damage and wall carry. But for max damage, you can run up and do down forward one plus two, you know, the no exceptions. Get unscaled damage. And I think that lands you like at 66 or something. So it's a good combo. It's easy to do and it has nice carry. It might actually be what I would use if I played this character, which I don't. Um, the standard combo that you see people use all the time is the launch up forward four. I think it's down forward four to hold. Intimidation 1 plus 2, run up, up forward 4, forward 3, 2. I think I got that right. Uh, it's not a difficult combo to learn, so spend some time in practice mode, and I, I'm sure you'll get it uh, sooner or later. Honestly, the best decision I ever made is to have Eris greet me every morning. I'm guessing this is like the his phone that he uses for a, a alarm clock. I have uh, mine right here. Do you want to see who greets me every morning? Can you tell who it is? <laughs> I think that's like some um, fan art that somebody made, but I thought it was really cool. So uh, that's what I look at in the morning. What else is going on? I can deal with running moves. That's an interesting question. If a character has a good running move, I'm finding myself hard to... Uh, I'm finding myself hard. Uh, I think he means um, I'm finding it hard to defend against them get counter hit or eating a lot of mix-ups because of staying passive uh, great question so running moves are super powerful in this game but they're usually uh, designed around being linear and so you're supposed to move around them to the side but that can be very hard some moves it's easy to do chloe's running three is a good move but it's very easy to step to the left um, and so you can't over rely on it if you're chloe because you're getting it stepped easily some good running twos like Claudio and Elisa, you can duck, but then they can mix that high, you know. 
Uh, but some of them, like Dragonov's running two and um, Noctis is running one plus two, it's so finicky. Like, you can feel like you did the step perfect, but you still get clipped and now you're going to eat massive damage. It's really annoying. And in those cases, my big tip would be experiment with what your character has in terms of armor moves. I think I even mentioned it in that recent um, Elisa overview on Blasted Salami that I wrote that you can use Elisa's Broken Dream, which is this uh, big, long uh, power crush move, and then you get guaranteed Moonglide 4. So you get a nice chunk of damage, and you actually trade favorably with your opponent's um, running move, because you're still going to eat that damage when you armor through the move. And so that's a way to uh, discourage opponents from abusing it. Uh, however, that's not going to help you if the last hit you know, is going to kill you. Um, if you try and armor through then, then you're still going to lose. And if your character has shitty armor moves, then it's not going to help either. But it's uh, one thing to um, to try out. can be really effective. Some of those running moves, for example, the running 1 plus 2 from Noctis, it's also a good uh, idea to try and jab them out of it. A lot of Zafina's gap closers, you can jab them out of it fast, and then you can float them and do a float combo as well. But the classic strategy you're supposed to use is to move sideways, and even though it's hard, it's very important because a lot of moves are extremely good and balanced around the fact that you're supposed to be able to move around them. Their one weakness is linearity. And so if you don't uh, step to the side, then the opponent is going to be able to abuse those moves. How and when will Season 4 be announced? I wish I knew. Um, I don't think anybody does, but I'm pretty sure that Season 4 is still happening. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that, but we might have to wait until, like, you know, offline events start back up again. What's the best advice for an MK player who just started playing Tekken? Well, I don't play NRS games, um, so I don't know the major differences, but I do know that that's a 2D game. So I would say don't underestimate uh, sideways movement and don't leave it too late to start experimenting with it. I think what happens with a lot of new Tekken players is they uh, they start playing very linearly in the, in the beginning, and then they start experimenting with sidestepping at some point, and then that clicks, and then they do it more and more. But start doing it right away. It's such an important part of the game, uh, and it's you know something unique to Tekken and other 3D games. A lot of like uh, cool fan art being made, people reaching new ranks, making videos, having fun, enjoying the game. It's great to see. It finally happened. I don't know what happened, but there's a Brian here, so I'm willing to bet that it's uh, an in-game taunt jet upper. <laughs> if it is a taunt jet upper, I mean, it's if you love like trying to pull that off and you get it and you're excited, then that's a, a fun way to enjoy the video game, right? But uh, don't waste too much time trying to pull taunt jet up, uh, jet up taunt jet upper off in matches because it's so difficult that almost nobody's going to do it reliably and there are probably more important things and you know execution that you can work on but of course if you want to do it because it's fun and exciting to be able to get it then uh you know knock yourself out should i get gone ryu dlc or maybe after they uh, release the news next season he might be discounted well i don't know if there's going to be a discount for Gone Ryu DLC in the future, but if you're thinking about getting a, a DLC character, I think Gone Ryu is a great choice. It's a very strong character. I think one that is being slept on right now in the game. I've said this before, but if tournaments were happening right now, I think this character would be a, a big factor on the tournament scene. I think he's very strong and fun to play and, and cool new stuff with the uh, stance and everything. So... It's uh, uh, if you're going to buy like one DLC character and you're interested in, in Gonryo, I think it's a great choice. How do I deal with Lace Floor Bullshit? Um, his neutral game seems pretty weak. I think I agree. But whenever lay players can't get through my defense, they just start spamming his floor nonsense. As a Kazia, Armor King, and Dragonov player, how do I deal with this? Well... <clears throat> I think there are a couple of characters like that who will go on the floor and sort of invite you to chase them and then they try and hit you on the way in with low launchers and stuff. Um, and don't fall for the trap, you know. If they want to go down on the floor, try and just disengage and not be anywhere near them and let them roll around on the floor. Uh, if, I mean, you probably don't play Elisa. Very few people do, but I can throw a 
ground traveling fireball i can jump in the air and dive kick down and hit them but there are probably things you can do that uh, don't involve you know exposing yourself to all that risk another thing you can do is before they get comfortable on the ground when you think they're going to do that transition try and like chase them right away and catch them as they're doing it uh, but once they're down there and comfortable they're inviting you to try and hit them and chase them um, and so don't fall for that trap would be my uh, big tip i will also say that it's interesting you say in this post like um when they can't get through my defense they start like going on the floor and doing nonsense well if you're being a turtle and you're blocking a lot your opponent has to start relying on throws lows maybe on blockables to break you down and so you're making them do that with your strategy and so your strategy should be to make them do that and then predict when it's going to happen and capitalize on it you know that's how you strategize as a turtle right so uh, you're making them go to like lows and, and snake edges by not allowing them to hit with anything else. I'm sorry, there are like some some kids running past screaming. I hope you can't hear that, but we're just gonna keep on going. PS5 may have a solution for rage quits. AI taking over for a quitting player. What does that mean? Oh, I think they mean like if you're playing online and your opponent quits on you the computer takes over and an AI starts controlling their character. If that's the idea, then I think it's a, a terrible idea. Because, okay, I don't know if you've played single player lately in Tekken, but playing against an AI is so completely different from playing against a human that it might as well be a different game. There's like no overlap. They don't make decisions uh, in the same way at all. They don't move the same. There's like almost no connection whatsoever. So... It would be like playing a completely different and very strange opponent in the middle of it. Um, and it wouldn't even like be anything like playing against a real player. And like, okay, so depending on how high your rank is, is the, the AI going to be more or less difficult? Um, I don't know, unless they invent like actual artificial intelligence and there's some sort of like super AI who can think and, and, and learn like watch pro matches and become a good Tekken player and then you play against that that might work but I don't think it's going to happen so I don't think it's a good idea or a good solution to that problem there is almost no overlap between uh, Tekken against an NPC and Tekken against a human they might as well be different games uh, at, at least as far as I'm concerned how do I stop screaming at the screen like a little baby I keep saying to myself that I should keep cool and not get discouraged by losses, but what I'm doing is the exact opposite. Can anyone help me? Uh, th this is uh, a common and important question. I mean, the first thing I, I, I think you need to realize is that it happens to everybody. Like, everybody who plays this game gets frustrated. Um, very frustrated at times. But it is destructive to explode and, and scream and, and, and throw stuff it, it's not a good habit to get into i don't think it's definitely not gonna make you feel good inside uh, and so uh, one tip i can give you that might work is before you sit down to play if you go to youtube and you search for like a, a gamer rage video and you look at these videos of, of grown adults who are when you're not in that state when you're not angry it looks so silly and childish you know they're screaming, they're breaking expensive things like their television, they're yelling at other people. It just looks so pathetic. And just watch that before you sit down and realize that that's the club you're joining if you succumb to your own frustration and start screaming as well. Um, but another thing that I did when I was playing back in Sweden and, and I used to get really pissed sometimes, I would just change something in my room that was in my field of view when I was playing put something on my table, turn something, you know, uh, to the other side. And I would let that be like the physical reminder in the room that I had promised myself before I sat down that I was going to stay calm and not be frustrated. And it actually helped sometimes um, to, to sort of keep it in mind, to not let that frustration boil over. But if you're getting to that point where you're actually like physically screaming, I think it's important to just take a break right away because being angry does make you worse at tech and i can promise you that it's going to make you lose more and so you know you're angry you start losing because you're angry you lose more and it becomes this negative spiral where it's just going to get worse so yeah something to be careful about but i totally understand i mean everybody 
even the best players in the world get super frustrated, especially with online. How do you beat, <clears throat> losing my voice a little bit, how do you beat Claudio's back one? The homing move, right? That move always gets me and I really don't know what I can do to beat it in neutral. It's a safe homing mid with deceptively good range and uh, everybody spams it. Okay, so I'm not going to look it up, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, minus five, right? And I think... I don't remember exactly how fast it impacts. I think it's like uh, 17, 18, 18, 19, around there, which actually makes it a very good move. Uh, it impacts fast. It has a lot of properties. It's got the homing property. It's mid. It's safe. And it's got a built-in backswing or backstep after the move impact. Um, an important thing about Claudio to keep in mind, this is a common abused Claudio strategy online. He has a bunch of moves that have really good range and a bit of pushback. Um, they're minus, but they're safe. So he does one of them, and then there's a bit of space between you and him. You try and take your turn with jabs or fast poke, and he uh, with punches that with hop kick or something else. So he's setting you up with those long range moves. So it's actually important to not try and take your turn unnecessarily with short range things and pokes against Claudio. And this move is one example. If it is like, you know, it is minus five, I'm pretty sure. Say it's 18 frames to impact. If he does two in a row, that means that the second hit is effectively coming out of 23. And I'm willing to bet that you have something nice mid uh, that's counter hitting faster than 23 frames with your character. So he shouldn't do multiples in a row, but if he does one, just let him do it and stay back. If he does a hop kick or tries to uh, swing at you or punish you with something, let him do that and then punish that. Uh, but it's important to not try and take every opportunity to swing against a Claudio because that's usually what they're waiting for. Beating Claudio online has more to do with like finding down back three and blocking them. Uh, block punishing hop kicks consistently when they gamble on them. Ducking running two and so on. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very good move and it wall splats and everything. Coming from uh, For Honor. Man, I love For Honor. I used to play... When that game came out, I was so excited and I loved it. I honestly loved For Honor. It was... It has such a great feel to it when you played it. I, um, I was completely like uh, obsessive about that game for a while, but I had terrible connection issues with like disconnects and, and lag so I had to eventually give up on it but I loved For Honor and then I heard people talking about it, it like failed and it didn't really find an, uh, an audience but apparently people still play it. I love uh, Vikings and shit so I would play I think he was called the Overlord uh, which is the, the sword and board Viking with the helmet uh, which you, you could really tank up and like headbutt people and stuff it was great. And then the Raider, which is the big Viking with the long axe where you could hit them with the hilt. Um, and then the other character I liked was there was a, a knight character with a flail that you could wind up, you know, and swing in these wide arcs. It was super interesting, super deep, beautiful, and had an amazing feel to it. I loved For Honor. I think it's a, like, mechanically a legit fighting game when you played it, like, one-on-one, -on -one, but I had to give up on it. But sorry, let's get back to this, guys question um also i didn't really understand frames like how fast is 10 frames it's one sixth of one one second and for honor we measure in ms millisecond wow i didn't know that that's weird so actual like an actual measurement of time so in for honor the normal jab is 500 milliseconds uh, which is reactable 10 frames equals how much ms I'm guessing it's pretty much unreactable. Well, 10 frame jabs are definitely unreactable. <sighs> Milli means 1,000th, right? So 500 milliseconds is half a second, right? It's 0.5 seconds. I hope I'm getting that right. But if that's true, then 500 milliseconds, because in Tekken, Tekken runs at 60 frames per second. So 0.5 seconds is 30 frames. So... 500 milliseconds would be 30 frames in Tekken, and that is reactable in Tekken as well. 10 frames is not. Usually, reactability lies somewhere in the middle of that, depending on who you are, depending on online, offline, somewhere around 20 frames. So, 
uh, anything faster than that is generally considered unreactable in this game, and we do have uh, unreactable jabs in this game. It would be interesting if the fastest moves in the game, like jabs, were reactable. I wonder what that would uh, do to the game. Probably the best player would just always be the player with the best, best reaction time. Interesting, but For Honor, For Honor is such a cool game. I really miss it. I should probably uh, get back into it. Uh, is it on PS4? Maybe I should get it on PS4. Um, which character is stronger, Geese or Julia? And which one is easier to pick up and learn? It's a good question. Uh, both Geese and Julia are very good characters. Uh, very, very strong. And um, in terms of execution, Julia is like the more traditional character because she doesn't have all the 2D weirdness of Geese, but she's not a no-brainer in terms of execution either. Don't get me wrong, you can unga bunga very hard with either of these characters, I think especially Julia, just run at your opponent screaming with massive stuff and do like big lows and spam the mad axis and, and everything else, but there's some execution stuff with her wind twirl combos, the uh, Corsica Ford 1 that you have to do and stuff like that, so neither is super easy to use and neither is weak, so if you're trying to decide between the two of them, uh, make the choice for some other reason. Which character do you think is more fun to use? Which one do you think looks cooler? Because I think they're comparable in both strength and execution difficulty. Geese is probably the slightly more difficult character to use. What else is going on with Tekken? Steve is my favorite character, but I can't do his basic combos. Any tips here? Uh, practice. I mean, just sit in practice mode for a long time, and then the next time you play Tekken, do it again. Eventually, it's going to happen. If, I mean, there are so many Steve players in the world who are pulling off those combos every day, so there's no reason you should be uniquely bad at it. You just need to get to that point where you've done them enough times that it starts making sense and end up in your muscle memory. <laughs> Tips for tilting people as Noctis. I play pretty casually, pretty much only play to tilt people with Noctis down back two uh, and down back one plus two. Does anybody have any tips um, to make them hate their life even more? Well, obviously running one plus two, but I'm guessing you're already using that because that's the trifecta with the two moves that you mentioned for a, a very annoying Noctis. The other thing you can do is you can do the roll and then, you know, the slide under low and then you can collect the down back one plus two guaranteed on hit. And then they have to listen to that uh, sound effect and see that move even more, which is going to be even more frustrating in the long run. So that's a good idea. Uh, another thing you can do is you can do his 1 plus 2, which is the big, you know, uh, tornado spin move with the big sword. And you can cancel the second hit, and they're going to stop expecting the second hit. And then you start throwing, uh, doing 1 plus 2 throws. Uh, that's going to frustrate people as well. But there you go. I mean, Tekken is there are people out there in the world who will play this uh, game specifically because they want to annoy others. I mean, this guy's probably trolling. It's a pretty funny post, but... I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if there are people uh, out there. A lot of them, actually. When is the appropriate time to do Dragon Off? Up for two and up for three. So what what moves are those? I think the up for two is the jumping launcher where he jumps in with a punch, and I think the up for three is the the jumping launcher where he you used to have to do a, a tech roll to get up really quick and then do your combo. Um, I don't think there's ever a reason to do either, as far as I know. I'm not a Dragonov player, but he's one of those characters where you have a small collection of super effective moves, like a, a small co collection of extremely, extremely good moves. And it's more about like trying to place those with precision. You have up for four with Dragonov, which is one of the best uh, mids in the game, like easily. Fast, uh, low crush, Good range leads to a guaranteed mini combo for really good damage. If it's near the wall, you can get even more. Um, it's like cataclysmically powerful, his up forward four. And I think it's better than both of the moves you mentioned. So maybe if you have to come up with a situation where you want to use either of them, maybe you shouldn't be using them that much at all. Maybe you should be using up forward four instead. 
Miguel, down back one question. I've been trying to find what can pick up after his down back one, but failing. Anyone happen to know? There are a couple of things you can do. The classic standard combo is, because you're going to be in crouch, so you can crouch cancel or you can do a while standing move. So the classic one is while standing four into down for one plus two, uh, and then you can hold forward and lean into savage if you want to. But you can also do while standing for rage driving at a combo, or you can crouch cancel into rage drive, and then you don't have to do a while standing move and get a combo. The other thing you can do is you can do forward forward at 2 1, and that's important at the wall. A lot of people don't know this, I think, but you can actually cancel crouch with forward dash in this game. So forward forward 2 1 is going to cancel your crouch for you, and you need to use that at the wall because the uh, while standing four combo isn't going to work when the wall is right there. So you do 4 4 2 1 and you spike them and now you're applying Oki at the wall which is very powerful. So those are a couple of things you can do after down back one. Unless you charge it up, if you charge it up you can do a full combo. Uh, it's not a good idea, it becomes a snake edge, plain and simple. But uh, I think what you want to do for the combo then is you can do while standing one and then combo I think is an easy, easy option. Is this game the last Tekken? It would uh, definitely surprise me because it's very successful and very profitable. And that usually means that there's more in the future. What else? Question about frame data. I'm not new at this game, but I haven't really gotten into learning about frame data. I just wanted to ask something about it. So in a situation, let's say, where I whiff a move and I'm now minus nine frames. If I try to do a jab that's ten frames... Uh, if it takes 19 frames to do it, is that how it works? The short answer is no. We don't really talk about minus frames on whiff because that doesn't really make sense. When we're talking about minus frames, it, it's not like we're comparing the recovery animation of two characters. You're minus relative to the opponent's character. It's not like it changes the impact speed of your actual moves. Okay, let's try and explain this with an example. It's going to take some time, but framed it as one of those things where it's just a lot of information in the beginning, but it's actually quite simple. So once you get over that initial hurdle of understanding it, it's pretty simple. So what's happening in the game is, say that we're dealing with a 10 frame jab. I press the button and the uh, move is going to animate for 10 frames before it becomes active so to speak before it has the ability to hit or be blocked by the opponent before it can actually do something before that it's during its startup animation and during that startup animation is when you can counter hit characters you can also counter hit them on the frames where the their move is active and actively has the ability to interact with an opponent uh, proof of that is You've probably seen two characters in Tekken counter hit one another and then both get stunned uh, and launched and fall down. Um, that is because you are hitting each other with counter hit launchers on the same frame. So proof that you can counter hit people during their active frames. But the move starts up, then it impacts, and then after it's done impacting, there's the recovery animation where your character goes back to their normal standing position. Uh... And during that recovery animation, you, you cannot block, you cannot attack or move or do anything. You're stuck in that recovery animation. Um, and so when we're talking about minus frames, what's happening is I'm doing a move. My opponent is blocking it. And then my character start, starts recovering back to that initial position. And my opponent's character does it as well. If his character gets back to that normal position where he can take his next action faster than I do, then he's plus. Because he can take his next action earlier than I can. So you see, it's a comparison between the recovery animation of the two characters. It doesn't actually change impact speed of moves. So, for example, say that I am minus four. That means that me and my opponent, we interacted in some way. We're both recovering back to where we can do the next thing my opponent is going to get back to that position four frames faster than I am. So he has a four frame window where he can do things and I can do nothing because I'm still busy recovering. If I then do a 10 frame jab, my jab isn't 14 frames. It's the 10 frames of the uh, impact of the jab plus the four frames of recovery I still have to do. So for a total of 14, right? 
And so for this whole package to make sense, the last thing you need to understand is punishment. So say I do a move, uh, my opponent blocks it, we're both recovering, and my opponent is going to come back to that state where he can take action again 12 frames faster than I am. That means that there's a 12 frame window where he can do things, he or she can do things, and I can't do anything, including block. So if my opponent does a move that is 12 frames or faster, it's always going to register as a hit. I can't block it. I don't have that power. I'm stuck recovering. A whiff punish is when I do a move and it hits nothing but air. It doesn't interact with my opponent's model at all. But after I do that move, I still have to do the recovery animation and go back to my normal position where I can block again. And if you hit somebody during that recovery animation where there hasn't been interaction, that's a whiff punish. So it's just hitting somebody during recovery. Before the move impacts and while it is impacting, you can counter hit and while the moves are recovering, you can punish. And so, as you see, we don't really talk about minus frames on, on whiff because it's a comparison uh, of the recovery animation of two characters. It's what's happening relatively between two characters. Um, and you can't really be minus in a vacuum, if that makes sense. Wow, that was a, a long question and a long answer. Uh, I hope it made some sense, but I think I'm going to end it right there. I really enjoyed making this again. It was fun. Uh, and I really enjoyed the last one as well. So if you did as well, then let me know and, and we'll make more. Uh, thank you so much for watching this one. And uh, I'll see you guys again very soon. Bye bye for now.